Well, we're going to continue in our study of Colossians in this first lesson. This is the third section. And we've looked at a little bit of the background and we've kind of looked at the introduction and some of the greetings and how Paul's beginning to set things up. Now we're going to begin into more of an extended section, um, but we're going to do it in parts, of course. Um, we're going to look at verses um, 3 through 24. And uh, that's going to be over the next couple of lessons. But we're going to begin looking at verses 3 through 5 in this section. And what we really are seeing here is a, an extended prayer. The, he, Paul gives his greeting, and then he basically goes into a prayer through verse 24. And then after that, this is when he begins his, um, you know, the body of the letter, if you will. And it's interesting to note that from a cultural perspective, Paul is actually using a very common form of communication and letter writing style. Uh, matter of fact, we have, um, if you will, MLA or whatever kind of style guide you, you want to equate to today uh, from this time period, which sort of outlined, here's how you write a letter. And this particular style, Paul's epistles in general, and a lot of the, the letters in the New Testament follow this particular style. And part of the thing that's interesting about this style is the letters after a, a greeting, they tend to then go into a praise for deities or gods. Now, the, the, during this time, they would, of course, want to please the gods. Well, Paul takes this same form that the, the Colossians and everybody else in the Greco-Roman Empire would be familiar with, and he, if you will, Christianizes it. In other words, he says, I'm going to praise God, yes, but I'm going to do it appropriately. I'm not going to do it just because I need to flatter God. I am actually praising God for things he's done, and in particular things he's done in the lives of the Colossians. And so he's using a form that's very familiar. We do this all the time. We just don't think about it. We use things and forms that are familiar to our time and our culture to communicate with, uh, just like I'm doing video. But for all of you English teachers, isn't it great to know that there were style guides 2,000 years ago on how to write a proper letter? And it still exists today. So let's, let's look at what Paul says. I'm going to read this, this whole section, you know, verses 3 through 5 here. And then we're going to sort of break it down and see what, he, what he's trying to uh, encourage them uh, based on the uh, attacks or the corrosive uh, pressure that the Colossians are facing. Beginning in verse 3, it says, We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up, in, laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. And so there's a lot of things that are going to be laid out here. And again, this is a prayer, but it's interesting. Paul begins off, he says, I want to thank God. The first reaction, I want to thank God, our Father, uh, of, our, of our Lord Jesus. So we've got you know, God the Father. He's our Father. We've already seen Paul talk about being you know, your Father our, and our Father. And he thanks God for these people. And he says, praying always for you. And he's linking God the Father his thankfulness for what God the Father has done in Jesus Christ, and linking all of that to thanking God for what he's done in them. And he's always praying for them for what God the Father has done through Jesus Christ. And that's a very interesting thing. He just follows on through and says, I want you to understand because of who God the Father is and what Jesus Christ has done, I'm praying for you. Now we're going to see how that flows out for a second, in a second. And when we look at this, it says, we give thanks and always praying for you. Now, grammatically, the always could be always praying, or it could be always giving thanks. And it could be understood either way, the way the, the, the Greek is, is structured here. And I find it's interesting, the way it's written here in this translation is praying always for you. Well, we probably don't see that Paul's always praying for them. It's more of the idea, whenever you come to mind, I pray for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm always praying for you. This is something that's just part of normal life and things that, that I do. And he says, we give thanks when we're praying for you. And so we could say, we're always giving thanks when we're praying for you. Or we're, whenever we're praying for you, we give thanks. It really doesn't matter. But what's important is they're, one, remembered. And two, they are a cause for Paul to thank God. 
How many times do we uh, sit down and say, I thank God for you? We might tell somebody we want to encourage them, and of course Paul's going to do some encouragement here, but he's literally saying, I give thanks for you to God for what he's done. And now he has uh, an, an interesting set of phrases. The second thing we see is he says, since we heard of your faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. The thanks isn't just for some abstract idea. Hey, we give thanks to God for you. Hey, love you guys. He says, I give thanks ever since I heard of your faith. Okay, so evidently Paul hasn't seen their faith. He's heard of their faith. So again, this is why we don't believe that Paul actually went to Colossae. This was Epaphras who is communicating these things. But evidently, there's something about their faith that's noteworthy, that people would talk about, that people would see and Paul would hear. And so this is not a faith that he says, oh, I'm glad you walked an aisle. I'm glad you prayed a prayer. I heard you have a big church. It says, since I heard of your faith. And it's not just, again, oh, these guys are believers. Because he doesn't stop there. The second part of it, he says, and the love which you have for all the saints. This love, as, we, as we're talking about, the faith has to be understood and seen to be able to be spoken of. And that love, that faith is demonstrative in their love for all the saints. And it's, it's also interesting to note, he said, he's not just saying that love you have for each other. He says, the love you have for all the saints. So in other words, they're not just cloistered, hidden away in a cave someplace. You know, hey, let's go study, study, study. Let's look at this stuff. Though they are learning, they're growing. Matter of fact, this whole letter, they're going to learn and grow through. But their love is demonstrative in a way that's not just local, but for all the saints. We care about other people. It's not just our little church. It's all the people, all the believers. And that's kind of cool. Because so... Can you think about how exciting it is to give God thanks for believers who have faith in the Lord that you've heard about and that they have love for all the saints? And this kind of fits into the same words that John, that uh, Christ said and is recorded in John uh, 13, 35. This is what Jesus said. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. In other words, we're supposed to make disciples. A disciple is a follower of somebody, a one who imitates somebody, not just, hey, I, I, I said I, I like the guy. No, a disciple is somebody who follows. And he says, if you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And Paul recognizes, I've heard of your faith and I recognize your faith. It's seen, it's understood because of the love you have for all the saints. And you can imagine all these things that the, the, the Colossians may be wondering, may be being collapsed under. Well, are you really saints? Do you really part of it? You're, aren't you, you're not really part of anything. And, you know, how, what kind of love do you really have? He says, no, no, no. I give thanks for your faith. I give thanks for your love. It's amazing. Now, verse 5 is it, interesting. He, he, he continues on and he says, why do I do this? He says, or why do you have this faith and this love? He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. And the, the treasure in heaven, of course, could be, or the hope that they have in heaven is Christ, because he's in heaven with seated at the Father. But this context leads us more to, instead of, okay, looking, whoo, there's some, some hope someplace um, or a or, or reality someplace, but you have a hope that's in heaven, in Christ, because of your lives. Uh, it, 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 it goes very much again with Matthew uh, 6, 20 through 21. And Jesus is again talking about what is your life supposed to look like? Well, it's supposed to be something heaven-oriented. He says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves, thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. So he's linking their heart, their love, their care, and their treasure in heaven, their hope in heaven, all together and saying, this is a complete package. It's not just a, a one-off or a piece of it. It's a complete package. And Peter describes the same thing in 1 Peter uh, 1, 4, when he talks about our inheritance in heaven, that we have an imperishable one. Uh, and it's amazing to think that just at the beginning when he says, I'm giving thanks to God for this holistic view of who you are, what you do, and how you think. Well, that's pretty, pretty good if somebody's attacking, saying, well, who are you? What do you believe? What hope do you have? Which we're going to see here in a second. If the Gentiles here in, in Colossae, which most likely most of these people were, were being attacked by the Jews, which I think is the more probable answer. We'll talk about the Gnostics here in a second. But they would be saying, you Gentiles have no hope. To a non-Christian Jew, the Gentiles were outside the family. They, they had no hope. Well, they're saying, no. Paul's saying, no, you have a hope that's in heaven. That would be very powerful. And they could come back to those people saying, no, I do have hope. I have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have hope, and it's demonstrative by my love for one another. We care about each other. We are family because God is our Father. Jesus is our brother. So this reinforcement just begins to lay a, again, sort of a, a structure for the arguments that we're going to see later. Now, the second thing that's interesting about this, he says, it's the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the, go in the word of truth, the gospel. Now, forgive me if I get on a little soapbox here, but right here, Paul makes it very clear. The word gospel, good news, literally, is not something that we just limit to a small piece of Christianity or teaching or belief. So often today, now we might intellectually say, oh no, no, this isn't correct. But in practice, what the gospel has become is believe and you're saved, we're good. And that's it. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, clearly that is good news. It's amazing. The redemption we're going to see and all the other stuff that Paul will talk about, that's fabulous news, but that's not it. That's not all it is. Matter of fact, when Paul says it, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So clearly he's talking about a life, a love, a caring, a living out, which is in the word of truth. And that word of truth is the gospel. So it's the whole counsel of God. It's not just a piece of it. Too often we get ourselves wrapped around and we separate justification and we call that the gospel okay, I'm saved. And sanctification, the ongoing process of growing in grace and imitating of Christ and all the other things that we're supposed to be doing. And we sort of separate and say, oh, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Paul says, uh-uh, the good news is all of it. Or, of course, we forget about you need to be saved and, oh, look at all the good works I'm doing. Well, that's not the way it needs to be worked out either. So this is a holistic thing, a holistic idea. And that word of truth, the hope laid up for you in heaven, is something as part of the word of truth. And that's good news. All of it's good news. And that's what we need to live and believe and work in and not limit the gospel meaning to being you were just saved. Because if, you're, if you really are saved, all the rest of it's going to come with it and you're going to have to participate in it. And we're going to see that as we progress on through this book. The other little thing I want to note here is faith, hope, and love are all mentioned in verses 4 and 5. Because he talks about, since uh, we heard of the faith you have and the love you have. So faith and love are there. And then he says, for, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And this is a very common idea. In this particular book, or this particular letter, should I say, hope seems to be the emphasis. Love is there. Faith is there, but it's hope because these Gentiles would be battered with, you have no hope, you have no hope. Yes, you do. And as we spoke of earlier, when that earthquake comes, what hope do they have unless it's in heaven? Because it's certainly not going to be around them in a couple of years. So 
that's kind of the beginning and the opening of this prayer of thanks. And next we're going to look at this hope and this word of truth and the gospel. We're going to look at the results and then we're also going to look at the messenger, Epaphras, the faithful messenger of this hope. So that'll be picked up in our next segment and that'll complete lesson one.